Hi everyone, my name is Joelle Ridgway. I'm the Director of Disability and Community Services with the Anne Arundel County Department of Aging and Disabilities. I'm so happy to be here with you today. I'm sorry that it's not in person, but I am grateful for the opportunities that technology has given us to stay connected with one another through the pandemic. At the Department of Aging and Disabilities, the highlight of the work that we do is our daily interaction with all of you. We are missing you. We hope that you're being safe and that you all are well. And we look forward to the time that we can all meet together again in person. Today, I wanted to share some information with you about a new program that we're offering called Fresh Food Fridays. In partnership with the Anne Arundel County Food Bank, we are offering free boxes of produce to Anne Arundel County residents with disabilities or people over the age of 60 who live in Anne Arundel County. To participate, you can just come to our location at 2664 Riva Road this Friday at two o'clock and we will load this great box of fresh produce into your vehicle for you. There's a variety of things in there that I think you'll be really happy with. Um, and we're really excited to be able to share this resource with you. So we look forward to seeing you this Friday at two o'clock at 2664 Riva Road. Take care of yourselves and we will see you soon. Hi, I'm Agriculture Secretary Sonny Perdue. In America, we are blessed with an abundant and affordable food supply, and nutrition information is available at your fingertips. So with so much health and nutrition information available online and just about everywhere else, it's become downright confusing. We may want to eat right, but just don't know where or how to start. We've been thinking at USDA about how to help people find simpler ways to move towards better eating. This is certainly important because about half of all American adults have one or more preventable chronic diseases like hypertension or diabetes. So let's get to work to change that. Most of you are already familiar with USDA's MyPlate Nutrition Education Tool and its website myplate.gov, which is a home base for this new initiative. I invite you to join me in a new campaign, Start Simple with My Plate, which can be found at choosemyplate.gov. The goal of this campaign is to provide easy things you can do to improve daily food choices. The My Plate team will provide ideas and inspirations that we can easily incorporate into our busy lives. Simple tips like make half of your grains whole or try fruit to satisfy your sweet cravings can make a difference in overall health and well-being over time. So let's start simple with my plate and together we can see how easy it can be to improve our food choices. Eating healthy is important. The foods and drinks you choose for meals and snacks can help you be healthier now and in the future. And it's more than eating one healthy meal or one healthy snack. Your food choices add up and they all matter. So where to start? First, choose foods from all five food groups throughout the day and throughout the week. Fruits, vegetables, grains, protein foods, and dairy. Your fruits and vegetables can be fresh, frozen, dried, or canned. Try roasting or steaming them as a healthful option. Try starting your day with whole grains, like oatmeal or whole grain cereal. For extra flavor and crunch, add your favorite fruit or a handful of nuts. Stuck in the same old routine? Mix up your protein foods. Try seafood twice a week. And enjoy milk and yogurt in recipes or on their own. Read labels and ingredient lists to compare foods and choose healthier options. Across all of your choices, drink and eat less sodium, saturated fat, and added sugars. And hey, we know it's not always on a plate. It's about making shifts no matter where you are. 
Start with small changes to make healthier choices you can enjoy. Small changes add up to big wins. How was your day at school? Mom! There's grapes. Can you find apples? I'll be honest, healthy eating has not come naturally. Can I do that? Every time I cook something, they're always like, what are you doing, Grandma? So I show to them, and this is our culture, this is our food. Just as much as we want him to do it, we have to model what we want. To me, healthy eating is real food, balanced, and a colorful plate. That's how I teach the kids healthy eating. It's a little bit crazier with us, with the newborn. We used to just eat together on the table. Now, we just take turns. My husband and I. If I had any tips to give to another pregnant or breastfeeding mother, I would definitely say keep a lot of snacks in your bag. It was really easy for me to grab apples while I was driving in the car if I was starving, and always tons of water. I do the uh, cooking, I do the food shopping, and um, then I'm, if Sophia is helping well, with dinner, I'm always in like a teacher mode. Okay. And I'm just teaching her, does it look good? Yes. Does it taste good? Yes. And is it healthy? And we kind of go through that as we cook. She's usually asking to take a bite, but I always encourage her. And she says, oh, just try one bite. If you don't like it, it's OK. You got to have a little tomato. But if you do, it's opened up your world. It's important to teach them about balance at an early age so that it becomes a lifelong <laughs> habit. It is incredibly challenging for me to be a single mom and to go to school and to work even part time. But now I'm really trying hard and especially with Josiah. I notice that he pays attention to what I'm eating and that he's more likely to try things if he sees that I eat them. You really set yourself up for success when you really just make those little alterations to your diet and your kid's diet. It makes a huge difference. Trying to find ways to get my son to be interested in healthy food and not, not name it good or bad. All right. I'm 38 weeks pregnant. When I get hungry and I'm not prepared, I make bad decisions. That's, that's what I would say, having stuff accessible. And clean and ready, right? Like, I've been in situations where the bag of grapes is in the fridge, it's but it still feels like it's too hard. <laughs> if the setup is there for you, then your split second decisions are still good. Dad's not home, mom does it all, and it's tough. They love to help me cook. Yeah. So I like to give them jobs, and they feel very important. Having them involved in the dinner process, to me, it's what's important. It makes them know that we eat our food together, we make our food together, we know what we're eating. The value of nutrition is something that they'll take with them and it'll last a lifetime, as well as hopefully they pass them to their kids as well. I put fruit out and the kids eat it. It doesn't need to be in a salad or anything fancy. Just get a banana, get an apple. Keep it simple and that's kind of what works. When I grocery shop, I actually go in, kind of see what's on sale to go with our meat and kind of maybe base the meal around that. The gym teachers in school, they focus on that. My plate, like look up there and that's what you should have. I grew up here, so I really wanted to come home after living away. I liked the idea of having land and a yard for the kids to run around in. My husband grew up a little bit differently. He grew up in the city and he, he said he, he'd like to have a backyard with the kids to run in too, so that's why we live here. Zinnia is really happy. She's our happy little flower. Declan is very art-oriented, nature. Hudson is more active, sports, sports. karate, very different. Could be more different. To me, healthy eating is real food, balanced, and a colorful plate. That's how I teach the kids healthy eating. I try to do the shopping. We don't really bring them with us. I just kind of, I go in, I go out, I get what's on the list pretty much, and that's it. I can't do it like that, because I get distracted by this or this, and so that's why this partnership works out. So we're Laotian, and well, half, they're half Laotian. And I think it's important to have understand where we came from, you know, originally. And my mother always taught them that. It's a short song, but it's mean a lot. <laughs> my mother has always cooked with them. Food is so much. <laughs> 
it's ingrained in Laotian culture. Every time I cook something, they're always like, what are you doing, Grandma? So I show to them, and this is our culture, this is our food, and to have my culture alive, it's very important to me, and I try to teach them. So singing the song, you know, in our language, so we do that too. It's helpful to have her around all the time, always access to her. They want to be a part of the action as well, and they love cooking with her. They want to, they want to help her. They, they just love her, so that's what time that they do with her, and they all remember that growing up. They love eating and they love trying new things, so to have and keep reintroducing new foods from my mother is, is great. I read once that if kids play with their food or understand where it's coming from, they're more up to try and eat it. So I think that, you know, the growing, the helping us cook, it really ties into them eating it as well. Last summer was the first time we had a garden. That was at Declan's, totally at Declan's request, we did the garden. And it turned out phenomenal. What colors are we eating? Orange. 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 Declan went to school and they taught him to eat his colors and we started at home and then we just continued it because it was very helpful. Like, oh, what's green on your plate? What should we, we should try that green thing. We should try that, those orange things. It's a little bit crazier with us with the newborn. We used to just eat together on the table. Now we just take turns. My husband and I. All right, let's go outside. I always try to get them outside, you know, playing. I, I find it really important. Declan always pays attention to what I'm eating because he says that whatever I eat, Zinni eats too. If I had any tips to give to another pregnant or breastfeeding mother, I would definitely say keep a lot of snacks in your bag. It was really easy for me to grab apples while I was driving in the car if I was starving and always tons of water. Planning ahead is key just to have an idea, even if it's not, okay, exact, just to have an idea. I know life is crazy and it's hard, but that makes things a little easier. We're Lilac and PJ. And these are our family's healthy eating solutions. Well, thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedules to come today. Hopefully you'll learn a few things that you can take away and use right away in your home gardens. The person who's joining me later for questions is Roseanne Rivolo, and she's right up front here. So if you give me really tough questions about gardening, she's here to help. So as um, Diana said, I'm going to talk a little bit about what pollination is, why you might want to attract pollinators, and who the pollinators are and what they need. For those of you who aren't biologists, pollination is movement of the male pollen grain to the female part of the plant. It uh, gets stuck to the stigma and then sends a shoot down uh, to the ovary if it's successful to produce a seed. So pollen can be transported by wind, by water, or by animals. Pollen that's transported by wind so is usually things like grasses, and some of the trees that have inconspicuous flowers like oak and maple trees. And it's very light and they produce lots of it because it's just getting thrown out to the wind and hopefully going to hit something, uh, another tree of the same species or, or grass of the same species. And that's typically what triggers allergic reactions. Things that are pollinated by animals tend to produce bigger, stickier pollen and less of it. So animal pollinators are useful to plants because they increase their ability to outcross, which produces more genetic variation. So if conditions change, some members of the population might be more suited to those new conditions. So over time, that's useful to the plant species. Um, it also can produce, uh, increase the quality of the fruit. Sometimes what will happen is if you have a berry, you might notice not every little bit of the berry is filled out, and that's usually incomplete pollination will do something like that. Or if you've got a misshapen fruit, you know, an apple that isn't perfectly apple-shaped. Um, so that's why plants invest a lot of resources in producing nectar and flowers to attract animals to move their pollen from one plant to another.
Okay, so why do you want to spend your time trying to attract pollinators? Well, if you're gardening with fruits and vegetables, many of them either require animal pollinators or are benefited by animal pollinators. Um, this poster that was done several years ago by the North American Pollinator Protection Campaign illustrates a lot of our common fruits and vegetables uh, that are animal pollinated. Um, in the U.S., there's over 100 crops that are animal pollinated. And the value of um, pollinators is around uh, $30 billion in crops. Now, it's the crops that are pollinated by animals plus the crops whose seeds require animal pollination. The other possibility is you're not a gardener, but maybe you like to watch wildlife. Well, three quarters of our flowering plants are animal pollinated. They produce fruits, seeds, and nuts that provide food for birds and other wildlife. So if you have these plants around, you're more likely to have the wildlife around. And the insect pollinators that you attract, perish the thought, become food for some birds and other wildlife. <laughs> um, and then, as I said earlier, animal pollination does increase the genetic diversity of the plant, so it's beneficial for your yard ecosystem. So what makes a good pollinator? Understanding what makes a good pollinator and a little bit about pollinators will help you in terms of selecting your plants for your garden. So we want something that's highly mobile because it has to be able to move from one plant to another. Um, it has to have something on it that pollen can attach to. So it can be hairs, feathers, scales. Um, in the case of bees, they actually, oops, they actually have structures where pollen collects uh, sometimes they're called baskets, sometimes they're on the legs, sometimes they're on part of the abdomen, depends on the species of bee. There's actually um, 4,000 species of native bee in the U.S. Good pollinators are also adapted to feeding on flowers, nectar, and pollen because they have to be attracted to that part of the plant to actually encounter the pollen. Many pollinators, the pollen just sticks to part of their body and is incidentally moved with them to the next plant. Bees actually collect pollen because um, they're using it as a food source. And then some of the pollen that they collect gets dropped off on the next plant, again, incidentally. Um, for the plant, it's beneficial if you have a species that doesn't visit a lot of different species of flower because it's more likely to have its pollen moved to a plant of the same species and have successful reproduction. Here's just a, a slide depicting some of the animal pollinators. So um, some birds, such as this hummingbird here. Um, I think that's an Anna's hummingbird. There are some bats, although the bats that are pollinators in the U.S. are found in the desert southwest. Um, the ones we have here eat primarily insects. Then we have um, a helicted bee. These are the ones that are that bright metallic green that you might see flying around. This is a skipper, so it's related to butterflies. This is what's called a long, long-horned beetle. And this is actually a fly. So flies that um, feed on flowers often mimic bees. Um, if you look real close, flies have two wings. Bees have four. So there's these little vestigial things called halteres that are where the wings would have been or used to be. So those are flies. Um, okay. So those are the primary pollinators we have in the U.S. Throughout the world, there are a few other animals that are also pollinators. So if you're looking to attract pollinators, the things that you need to do are to provide food, which is native plants. Some of the plants that have been bred for gardening to have really showy flowers don't have much in the way of pollen or nectar. That's why you're always better going with natives. All of the pollinators are attracted to nectar. It provides lots of quick energy. Some of them are attracted to the pollen. And then some, such as some of the beetles and butterflies, will actually eat the leaves of the plants in their larval stage. And this is um, a spicebush butterfly caterpillar. They're pretty cool caterpillars. Um, you also want to provide habitat, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, um, but 
They need sites for nesting. Bees particularly need nesting sites. About half the bees nest in the ground and half the bees nest in wood. Uh, resting and roosting sites are important uh, for butterflies, for birds, and then overwintering sites, uh, which sometimes may be just near the plants in the ground, sometimes might be on a plant, sometimes might be in a wood cavity. And then you'd want to do things to encourage beneficial insects that will eat other insects that may be preying on your plants for natural pest control so that you're not having to use a lot of pesticides because pesticides often affect non-targets and the non-targets here may be the pollinators you're trying to attract. So we'll go into detail. So the types of features on plants that attract pollinators, of course the nectar, because that provides food. Different types of pollinators are attracted to different colors and there's some general principles um, as to what color attracts what type of pollinators. And I've got handouts in the back about this. I'm not going to go through the details of that. Different shaped flowers. So for example, these flowers are very open, so it's easy for a pollinator to get into them. These flowers have a deep tube with the nectar at the bottom, so you either need, you need some sort of a long tongue to get in there or to be very tiny that you can crawl all the way to the bottom. Um, and so scent, particularly things like flies, they tend to like scents that are very unattractive to us, things that smell like rotting flesh and things like that. Pollen, if, the, if it's a bee, it's out there to collect pollen, so you need pollen. And then I'm just going to mention briefly nectar guides. It's a name for patterns that can be seen in flowers under UV light uh, with us and some um, insects can actually see these. And they're almost like little runways that point to where the nectar is on the plant. So we have our little pollinators coming in because we've done a good job of collecting our plants. Okay, so you want to choose a variety of color and shapes if you're trying to attract lots of different types of pollinators. You also want to plant in clumps um, this is so for two reasons. One, um, it's more attractive to the pollinators. They don't have to go as far between stops at plants to get nectar. And it's also better for the plants because your pollinator is more likely to hit something of the same species as it goes from one plant to the other. It's helpful to choose plants of different heights. You're providing some structure. Different pollinators may have different preferences, plus um, by having bushes that are a little taller, these actually provide nice roosting sites for butterflies. And then when you're planting your garden, it's good to choose plants that bloom over the entire season from early spring into fall. Otherwise, you know, your pollinators will be there for part of the season, but then they're going to have to go somewhere else to get to di dinner later in the season. Um, and information on bloom times is readily available. Um, there's actually uh, some sample brochures back there that you can download specific for your eco region. You just enter your zip code, the brochure pops up, and it has a lot of information on native plants, when they bloom, uh, what they attract, that sort of thing. Um, and I just wanted to show you a few native plants um, that you could use for a pollinator garden. So going clockwise from here, Virginia bluebells attract butterflies and they're out early in the spring. Most of you are familiar with black-eyed Susans out throughout the summer. They attract butterflies and bees. This is something called dense blazing star, also attracts butterflies and is out late in the summer. And this is pur purple coneflower, which attracts butterflies and bees and also provides seeds in the fall for birds. Uh, most of the things that attract butterflies provide nice landing pads that they can actually sit on, um, although they can get into long tubes like this. So let's talk a little bit more about providing habitat, and most of this slide really has to do with habitat for bees because they're kind of our super pollinators. 
As I said before, about half the bees nest in the ground and half nest in wood, so it's important to leave some natural wood laying around. It's also important to have little exposed patches of soil. So, you know, you might not want to do this in the middle of your yard, but maybe in the corners, in the back, away from the house. Um, also, the cut plant stems can be important because some bees will nest in those. And the same with piles of twigs and brush. Um, the tall grass and the shrubs are more for roosting butterflies. So don't be too neat around your yard. Or if you want a really neat yard, then the other alternative is to provide a nesting site using something like a bee block. And you can do a very natural one where you've just drilled holes into a stump, or you can do something a little bit more manufactured looking. Um, you absolutely have to use untreated wood. Treated wood will kill your bees. <clears throat> um, you can vary the block size. The hole sizes recommended here and on the sheets out back are really um, targeted toward orchard mason bees. But if you have a variety of sizes, you'll attract a variety of types of bees. Because smaller bees go for smaller holes, larger bees go for larger holes. Um, the depth of the hole will affect whether you're getting mostly males or females. So you might want to vary the depth of your holes. Um, I recommend lining them with paper, like tracing paper or paper straws, because then at the end of the season, you can pull that out and have a cleaner hole, because it's possible to transfer disease if, if the bees that were in there were diseased. So you probably don't want to keep these more than a few years. Um, and even if they're still looking good, you'd want to replace them. Probably the best height to mount them is about three feet. And you want to mount them on something sturdy, whether it's a fence post or uh, just a wooden post that you've stuck in the ground. And an area that has some sun and some shade. You don't want it to get too hot, but it does need some heat and sun for those bees to mature. And leave it out through late fall, because some bees will emerge later than others. So you don't want to take it in. Um, before they've all emerged or suddenly you'll find you have bees flying around your house. Um, you can even leave it out year round, it doesn't matter. Um, be forewarned, you may also get some wasps using these. So I would put it in an area that doesn't have a lot of traffic. You know, again, kind of away from your house, but near enough to your garden that, you know, the bees that are coming, nesting there will be um, pollinating in your garden. You may want to provide water, probably not super critical here in this area because we get a lot of water naturally. Um, some types of butterflies actually um, do what they call puddling. You'll see them down in the ground dipping their little proboscis, their little mouth parts into water, and they're actually getting minerals with the water. And then there are certain types of bees and wasps that, um, like this mud bee, that make their homes out of mud. And so, of course, they need mud around. To encourage beneficial insects, so you don't have to use a lot of pesticides, you want to have a diverse habitat. So some of the things we've talked about, a variety of native plants, having them at different heights. You're probably going to want to accept some damage on your plants. That little slug-like caterpillar that's eating your the leaves of your plant may actually turn out to be a really lovely butterfly when it's mature, so you might have to share your plants. Um, you can remove some pests by hand using gloves just in case that they have stingers or anything like that on them, although most of them around here probably won't um, if you've got a small infestation. Um, I know sometimes I'll get a lot of aphids on my plants and you can just hand remove those. So you want to try not to use pesticides, but if you have to, <clears throat> um, obviously you're not going to be using a helicopter to spray your pesticides. Can you imagine how little of the pesticide is actually reaching where it's supposed to be in this scenario? So what you want to do is choose the least toxic alternative that will do the job, least persistent, because something else will come along and get it later if it sits out in the environment too long as specific as can be. So there are a few things like BT that are very specific to groups of insects. 
Um, sprays and large granules are best. Dusts tend to blow around and get where they're not supposed to be. And I don't know that they sell them for uh, home use, but there are some microencapsulated formulations. And turns out they're about the size of pollen grains. So bees tend to collect them, which isn't good. Um, you want to target it so you're only applying it where you need it and time it to do it when things aren't blowing around, if possible when the flowers aren't in bloom, and when pollinators aren't active, which typically is at night. But you need to kind of know your area or observe your area. There are some bees that hang out in the fields at night. There's things out west like cactus moth that are attracted to night blooming flowers that are out at night. But in general, most things are typically active. Most pollinators are typically active during the day. Um, here's a list of resources which I've printed out and put on the back table. Uh, I wanted to thank Deb Rudis, who actually originally developed a, a presentation for garden groups, and I've massively adapted it for this. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, do check out the resources on the table. Uh, check out our website, uh, which links to lots of resources.